Hello, here we are again, and we're going to have our second study and seeing if we can have a systematic approach to prophecy. So what are we going to do with this time? Well, in study one, I tried to set up a systematic approach by saying we must pay, pay special attention to when a thing was written, where it is about, who wrote it, who is it about, and things like that. Uh, if we're going to have to get to the detail of prophecy. And we spent quite a bit of time looking on that word fulfilled. In study two, we're going to look at some more terminology, this odd expression, this is that, and then two very popular expressions, the last days and the day of the Lord. And then in study three, we'll look at the people to whom the prophecy was given, why it was given, if we can answer that question. And the two things that we have to distinguish between is conditional and unconditional prophecies. Then I'm going to have a look at Matthew 24 in detail, having seen what we've learned in studies one, two and three. And we'll finish off in study five by having some assorted prophecies like Isaiah 35 and Luke 61, um, Isaiah 35 and chapter 61, Luke 21. And I'll have a quick look at Revelation. Oh, dear me. And we'll conclude by pulling everything together. So this is that. This is what Peter says in Acts chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. You may remember on the day of Pentecost, people came to him and they said that these disciples were drunk. And Peter said, no, they're not drunk, he says. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream. Now remember, Joel was talking about the people of Israel. So he's talking about, God says, I will pour up my spirit on all the people of Israel, right? But there's a difference here in what Peter says and what Joel says. Joel says, and afterward, I will pour up my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Now, this is a very interesting prophecy, you see, <clears throat> because we'll need to look at this. And I've looked at it very thoroughly in uh, my book, Joel's Prophecy, Past and Future. So we'll just deal with one or two of the problems associated with this. Now, going back to what Peter said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And Joel has afterwards. So what is Joel talking about? Well, if you go back to Joel's prophecy, you will see that it's talking about the coming of the Messiah and that Israel will be restored. They will have plenty to eat until you are full and you will praise the name of the Lord God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be ashamed. Never again. Then you will know that I am in Israel and I am the Lord your God and that there is no other God, no other God. And my people will never again be ashamed. Twice he emphasizes that. And afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, this is talking about after the Messiah comes, after the Messiah comes to set up this glorious kingdom. Well, Peter is certainly quoting this after the Messiah came, but he didn't come as the Messiah Ben David, the great and glorious king that was going to establish this kingdom upon the earth. He came as the Messiah Ben Joseph, the lowly one. So Peter's taken it and putting it in a, a different time context and says that these are the last days. But here, Joel's talking about a totally different period of time. So many people think that the expression, the last days, refers exclusively to the days leading up to Jesus's return. And that's, that's not the situation. It, we will see later on in this study, it can refer to various times. And here, Joel, if he's talking about the last days, he's talking about afterward, he is referring to the days after Christ returns the second time as the Messiah Ben David, Silent David, who sets up the kingdom on the earth. <clears throat> so he says this is that, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it's not quite 
correct. Because if you look at what Joel says and what um, Peter says, um, we will see something very interesting. Right, in Acts chapter 2 then, if we carry on reading, and he quotes more or less fully from uh, from Joel's prophecy, after the bit about your young men will dream, see visions and your old men will dream dreams, he then goes on to say in verse 19, I will show you wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. <clears throat> now that didn't happen in Peter's day. That didn't happen. Okay, we have to recognize that. Um, Peter is saying this is that which was spoken of the prophet Joel, but it didn't quite come about exactly the same. And as some commentators said, it's probably better to look at what Peter is saying is, this is like that, which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. Joel is speaking about when the Messiah comes to set up his kingdom. And what we've had today, if you like, is a foretaste of that, a foretaste, part of it. Because yes, some of them did have the Holy Spirit poured out upon them. But it says, I will pour out my spirit on all the people of Israel. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Well, it didn't happen to all of them. It happened to some of them. So Joel is talking about a time after the Messiah has come and set up his kingdom upon the earth. Then his spirit will be poured out on all flesh. And that will happen after Christ returns. And this is not what happened on the day of Pentecost or what happened subsequently during the book of Acts. So what was Peter doing? He is taking a passage from the Old Testament, which has a complete fulfillment when the Messiah comes as the son of David and sets up this kingdom on earth. And he is applying it to the situation after the Messiah came as the Messiah ben Joseph and suffered. So it's similar to it. Parts of it, yes, okay, similar. But some of them had the Spirit poured upon them. Some of them did prophesy. Some of them did have visions. But not, not all, not all. So this is similar to. So be a bit careful with some of these prophecies. Some people think Joel was completely fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. It is not. And that's why I call my book Joel's Prophecy, Past and Future Fulfillments. Past and Future. Yes, there was something about Joel's prophecy that did happen on the day of Pentecost and during the book of Acts, but it was only a partial fulfillment. The total fulfillment will be when Christ returns as the great warrior king. <clears throat> so what was Peter doing and the others doing in taking these prophecies or expressions like we saw last time that Moses that Matthew took what were they doing well they were trying to encourage the Jews to believe in Jesus or they were building up the face of those who already did and those people those people those Jews they knew their scriptures and we see what Peter and Matthew and others were alluding to okay Unlike us, they weren't they were not sticklers for detail. Sometimes we can get bogged down in the detail, particularly with time. We are very much creatures of time, aren't we? You know, and the Bible is very vague about time in places. Um, <clears throat> some parts of the world today are a bit vague about time, but we are run by clocks, aren't we? And watches. Yes, there we go. No, they weren't stickler for detail, but they did like parallels, parallelism or similarities and comparable thoughts or they like if you like opposing thoughts or co contrasting thoughts or complementary thoughts and ideas which are different so that's what you get sometimes in their poetry I and mean, in sometimes you get it in the psalms and book of proverbs where something is said in one line and the next line something similar is said it doesn't rhyme like our poetry but you get similar thoughts or you may get something said in one line and then you get almost the opposite or a contrasting thing said in the next line. So that's how they thought. They thought differently to us. So with Matthew taking those 
verses out of the Old Testament and saying, ah, this is a fuller meaning to what was said back then. Wow, that's that's good. That's interesting. And if Peter is saying, well, look, you know, you know, Joel's prophecy. This is like what Joel said. You know, these men are not drunk. They are filled with the spirit. You know, wow. So that's how we move on. Now, let's have a look at eschatology, which is the study of the last days. By that, it often means the days leading up to Christ's return. Um, <clears throat> let's say we've got to be a bit careful because we've seen that Peter has applied this term, the last days, to what Joel referred to as the days after Christ's second coming. Usually these are seen as, well, very dark and difficult days. We have a number of passages which talk about them. 2 Timothy 3.1 3, is one. This is what it says. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Oh dear having a form of godliness but denying the power have nothing to do with them they are the kind who worm their ways into homes and gain control of a weak-willed women who are loaded, laden down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth well that's pretty bad isn't it hmm? I, I, have those last days come well some people think they're here today, but then people have thought that in the past, you know, that the days they are living are like that, you know. 2 Peter 3.3, 3. let's have a look what he says about them. 2 Peter 3.3, 3. first of all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and falling their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised, ever since our fathers died everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation they're scoffing because christ hasn't returned Our scoffing now in the book of acts remember it was possible for christ to return if the israel if the jews had repented yeah but anyway so where is this return and people are saying today where is this return you know you talk about this jesus of yours and then in 1 timothy 4 also we have a passage the Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon their faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. Well, there you go. So those those are three um, passages in the epistles which talk about the last days or the later times or the late latter days in the King James Version. And they're all pretty well, dire, aren't they? Um, have they ever been fulfilled? Have they ever come about? Well, certainly, you know, Joel's prophecy at the beginning of the book of Acts, it was a partially, partially come true. But didn't totally come true have these all come true in the past are they coming true today you may ask or are we are in a times where it's some some of it is happening and some of it isn't happening anyway you really do have to note the following this this also shows um this one that joel is is right in isaiah chapter 2 it reads and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountain and shall be exalted above all hills and all nations shall flow into it. And this is in the last days. Now, we've just read what the last days are like. It says they're going to be absolutely terrible, horrible, dire as can be. But here, if we read on, we find the following in Isaiah. In the last days, the mountain of the 
Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. That doesn't sound like what we read in Timothy and Peter. Does it? The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Hmm. Ah. Now, one of the purposes of prophecy is to solicit a response in the people to whom it's going. Here, Isaiah, if you read chapter one in particular, he really has a terrible go at the people. They're not keeping the law of Moses properly. Oh, they're keeping all the ceremonies. They're the hard, they're the easy bits, but they weren't looking after the widows, the poor, and all these people. So he says to them, come, repent. That's what he says to them. And this then goes on to say, look, this is what God is going to do in the last days. But the last days here referring to the days after he has come to set up his kingdom upon the earth. In other words, it's referring to after the Lord has come the second time. Okay. And so that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about the last days as that period of time after the Christ has come and set up his kingdom on earth. Just as Peter talked the last days, God, I will pour up my spirit on all people. It's equivalent to Joel saying afterward. After what? After the kingdom has been set up. So be very careful with this expression, the last days. Here, we have in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 to 5, the last days where everything is great and glorious. Right? And, and also Joel is, Peter's changing Joel slightly, and the Spirit's going to be poured out and it's all going to be lovely. Whereas the passages we read in Timothy and Peter, it was dire. So you have to be careful. You just can't see this expression in the last days and say, oh, it always refers to the days leading up to Christ's return. Be careful. The first time it occurs is in Genesis 49, verse 1. And there Jacob called his sons and said, gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. And you might want to read the whole of that chapter, or certainly verses 2 to 27 later, and you will see that there are various prophecies said about the 12 tribes of Israel, and that some of them can take place at different times. So we have to ask, to what time do these last days refer when we get the expression, or maybe to what times, plural? Now, it's very interesting in modern translations like the NIV, they translate that verse slightly differently. Then Jacob called for his sons and said, gather round so I can tell you what will happen to you in days to come. L literally, it is the last days, but they've changed it to avoid the ambiguity to in days to come. If we want to know what this expression means or to what time this expression refers, we have to let the context determine the time. We shouldn't let the expression dictate to us. The expression does not determine the time. Really, the, the expression is referring to some time in the future. Which time in the future? To the days just before Christ returns or to the days after Christ returns? So, the last days is better understood as days to come. As I said, sometimes referring to the days before Christ returns, sometimes to the days after Christ returns. Peter refers to it as the Acts period is the last time. And if you look, going back to Genesis 49, just to pick one out for you, 
This is, this is what uh, the prophecy was with respect to Judah. In verse 8, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hands will be on the neck of your enemy. Your father's sons will bow down to you. And that was fulfilled and the rest of it in David's reign. In David's reign. So this expression, the last days, and I deal with it in my book, The Last Days, when I go right through every reference to the last days, the latter days, and all expressions like that in the Bible. And we try to unravel as to when exactly that prophecy will take place. So we let the context of the prophecy define the time period. We don't let and try and push all of these things into one period just before Christ returns. You can't do that. You can't do that. OK. So some unspecified time in the future. So that prophecy that we read from 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 8. Um, I read it out. I won't read it fully again. We read it fully. This oh, also that in the last days perilous times can come. Is it referring exclusively to the days when Christ returns? Well, that you can judge that for yourself. <clears throat> but just let's have a look at this other one that we read um, in 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 3, where it talks, the Spirit clearly states that in the latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods. <clears throat> That's an interesting prophecy. <clears throat> During William Booth's days toward the end of the 19th century, they were terrible times, far worse than we're living in now. He started his work in the East End of London, where there were gin houses, gin houses, opium dens, child prostitution. People weren't getting married. If you've ever seen My Fair Lady, you know the song, I'm getting married in the morning, um, <clears throat> because people generally didn't get married. You know, and we are in this situation today where people don't forbid people to get married, but certainly the number of marriages are at the lowest they've been for a very long time in Britain, so probably the lowest since the Second World War. And we have all this stuff about certain foods you shouldn't eat, and yeah, don't eat this and don't eat that and don't eat the other. And I'm a vegan and I'm a, you know, um, yes, if you want to be it, that's fair enough. But so many people are seeing the days we live in as these later times. Well, they may be, they may not be. You know, in Wesley's day, 100 years before Booth, it was pretty bad then also. So it's very difficult to know whether some of these general prophecies about the behavior of people, when they've been fulfilled, is he saying to Timothy, and he's, this is going to happen later on in your lifetime? Because, you know, things in the Roman Empire were pretty degenerate. It was Peter writing to the Jews who were scattered throughout some parts of the Roman Empire saying, look, this is what's going to, this is what you will find later on in your life. I don't know. Prophecy is not easy. And as I say, it, it's, it's very good to have a spirit of humility when it comes to some of these types of prophecies, which, which are general about people's behavior, because you will always find certain groups of people behaving like that in every society. So the last days when, as I've said in this book, I've looked at every reference to the last days and related expressions such as the latter days, and they're all discussed and placed in time in the correct time frame, if possible, according to their context, not according to the expression. Now let's have a look at this day of the Lord, which is another expression. And many people, or at least some people, think that this also always refers to the days leading up to Christ's return. Well, I'm certain sometimes where we get the last days, they do refer to the days leading up to Christ's return. And certainly the day of the Lord in some places does refer to the days leading up to the Lord's return, but not exclusively. There's a beautiful passage about it in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 3. 
Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. He's already told them all about this. Gosh, I wish I'd been there and heard him. Never mind. You know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them, suddenly as labour pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. <clears throat> If you know anything about prophecy, you have this last seven years, the last seven years before Christ returns. That seven years starts when a particular covenant is set up and Israel are allowed to, if you like, rebuild their temple and have their sacrifices. The first three and a half years is a time of peace. And then the person who made this covenant, often called the Antichrist, breaks the covenant and makes life terrible for the people of Israel. That last three and a half years is often known as the day of the Lord. Okay, it is known as the day of the Lord. So they've had this, they're sitting there, they've had three and a half years of peace and they're all saying, oh, this is great. We got peace, we got safety and all of a sudden. Phew. However, later on in 2 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, he tells them not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly come from us, whether by a prophecy or a word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of Lord has already come. Of course it hasn't come, he says. You know what I've taught you about it, so why are some people saying the door, day of the Lord has already come? Well, possibly because of, I don't know, there are parts of the Old Testament where the, where the day of the Lord happened. We better have a look at some of this and try and sort it out. Anyway, thinking about this day of the Lord before we go and look at it, um, in the Old Testament, Joel talked about, he said, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon but to blood by the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. There we go. And Malachi says, says the same thing, basically. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Okay. But when we get to um, Acts chapter 2, verse 20, Peter, quoting from Joel, the translation is a bit misleading. The sun will be turned to darkness, yes, and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. <clears throat> <clears throat> what's glorious about it King James Version has the great and notable day of the Lord it's a dreadful day, it's a terrible day it's glorious if you like it's magnificent because of how horrible it's going to be it's how horrible it's going to be so be very you know it's sometimes it's very easy for us to build up theologies on one expression, on one verse and I've seen people use this translation from Acts 2 to 20 to talk about the great and glorious day of the Lord is a wonderful time. It's a wonderful time. Well, hang on a minute. It isn't. If you look at most of the references, it's the great and dreadful day of the Lord. But let's have a look at the prophecy of Obadiah, because this is what sometimes catches people out. Obadiah 1.15 says, the day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done it, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your head. Now, basically, Obadiah is a prophecy against the Edom, the descendants of Esau, and about those nations around them who helped Babylon when they came to conquer Jerusalem and Judea. Some of the Edomites even took prisoners of the people from Judah and gave them to the Babylonians. You need to read the Obadiah's prophecy and what went on at that time to understand it. I'm going to quote, I've written this book called uh, Introducing the Prophecy of Obadiah. It's, not, it, it's a good introduction to it. And there I write this, the day of the Lord is an expression that refers to a period of time when a nation or groups of people are judged and disciplined by God because of the evil they have done. 
it was seen that Edom's day of the Lord, the time God's judgment came upon them, was sometime in the mid 6th century BC, probably less than 30 years after Obadiah prophesied. And not only have I dealt with it in the book, if you like watching videos, the OBT has this uh, YouTube video uh, which deals with the prophecy of Obadiah and Agai actually, and I go into it there in more detail if you want to go into this. But the day of the Lord, sometimes in the Hebrew it's a day of the Lord, there's no the there, an a day of the Lord. So that's what we have to recognize. Again, don't let the expression, don't let the expression day of the Lord define the period of time, i.e. it always refers to the days leading up to Christ's return. Yes, it does refer to that period of time in places, but in other places it doesn't. What you do, you have to let the context of the statement of the prophecy, if you like, define the time period. Don't let the expression define the time period. That's the important thing to do. And I've also written this book, The Day of the Lord When. And again, I go through every reference in the scriptures to the day of the Lord or a day of the Lord or something similar. It's discussed and it's placed in its time context according to the, according to the context. It's placed in the correct time frame. At least I hope I've placed it in the correct time frame. But I've looked at the context to decide when it takes place. So that's what we've looked at today. We looked at this is that or this is like that spoken of by the prophet Joel. We've looked at the, the day of the Lord and we've looked at, you know, this last expression, what we've talked about. And we looked at the last days. Now, next study, we'll look at the people to whom prophecy was given. And we'll try and find out uh, when we look at some of these, why it was given. And we look at some conditional and unconditional prophecies. Before they, we go on to what is probably, well, many people's favorite prophetic passage, Matthew 24. Before in our last study, looking at assorted prophecies from Isaiah, Luke and Revelation. And then we'll pull all things together. So thank you very much. Thank you.